Welcome to Consider This, the popular podcast series brought to you by the Organization of Legal Professionals. I'm your host, Bridget Novak. This series will focus on the legal industry, current trends, substantive issues, and career perspectives. Each program will run approximately 15 minutes. We hope you stay tuned for this program and join us for others in the future. Today's guest is Herb Reutblatt, co-founder, chief scientist, and chief technology officer of Orchitech. Herb is recognized as the father of concept search and is an expert in search and retrieval technology. He's a co-founder of the Electronic Discovery Institute and a member of OLP's Board of Governors. We'll be talking today about concept search and the bigger topic of predictive coding, all with the goal of better understanding the various ways humans and machines can improve their e-discovery efforts. Welcome to the program, Herb. Thank you. It's great to be here. Good. Let's start off by asking you to define concept search so our listeners and I get quickly up to speed with your approach and how you helped revolutionize e-discovery. Concept search is a method for identifying relevant documents and their meaning rather than based on whether it happens to have a particular string of letters in it or not. Words in language actually have meaning. They're not just letters. So, for example, if I use uh, a sentence, if I use a word like court, and you don't necessarily know what it means, but if I say court, blah, 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 basketball, now you know what court means. If I say court, blah, 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 judge, now again, you know what court means. So it's the words around a word that uh, give the word its meaning. And the way that works in, uh, in, in e-discovery is that the computer system reads the documents. And as it reads the documents, it looks at how words uh, occur together, whether court occurs with basketball or court occurs with judge. And it learns the meaning of the words from the documents that it reads. So no one has to actually teach it that meaning, but it learns it from having read the documents. So by their context, by the other words on either side of it. Okay. So when one does a concept search, uh, it highlights those documents that are most about the topic. And does it have a way of ranking them then? Yes. Uh, It ranks them. The documents that are most about the topic are at the top of the list. And uh, documents that are less and less about that topic are further down the list. Eventually, you can get to documents that don't have the word that you searched for. And they'll still appear on the list because they still share context with the word that you did search for. Give us an example of that. Well, we have uh, the word Cuiaba. And Cuiaba is one of the partners that got Enron into trouble. At the top of the list are documents that talk about Cuiaba, LLC1, LJM, and other of the partnerships that got Enron into trouble. And further down the list are documents that don't have the word Cuiaba in them at all, but still talk about LJM and uh, the other partnerships. So it helps you to find at the top of the list documents that are most about the topic. And further down the list, it helps you to find documents that are related to that document, even if they don't happen to have that keyword in it. Again, the computer is doing this without any human intervention or involvement? That's right. Now, people can do something similar by building what are called taxonomies or ontologies, uh, or even a thesaurus, where somebody sits down and writes down all the words related to every other word. But that's always limited to what the people can think of uh, at the time. And if you let the computer do it, the computer works with the particular documents you have and learns the meaning of words in that particular context. So in Enron, for example, rawhide doesn't refer to leather as it would if we were using a thesaurus. It refers to one of the partnerships, one of the -the off-the-books partnerships. Okay, so in this sense, the computer is training the human, the training the computer. (laughs) They're training each other. Yes. No, no, that's essentially right, because people have ideas about what things ought to mean. They have ideas when they read things about what they do mean, but you can't think of everything. One of the big problems in doing any kind of searching um, for documents is it's hard to guess what words people used, and it's hard to guess what the words meant to those people when when they use them. So one problem is is, uh, polysemy. That means that words have lots of different meanings. So the word rawhide could mean leather or it could mean a partnership. The word um, bark could mean the side of a tree or the sound that a dog makes or it could mean a kind of a boat. 
um, the word court we already talked about. So words can have multiple meanings. At the same time, um, there are lots of ways of saying the same thing. There's more than 100 words that express the idea of think. So you can think, you can surmise, you can suppose. And it's hard to guess which of those words people used. Then on top of that, you have people always making up words. People can make up all kinds of words that, that they want. And we get the, uh, the Humpty Dumpty effect, where people use words to mean whatever they choose it to mean. And we get other kinds of effects where people just make up brand new words to, to mean something brand new. Um, so you can use words like tweet, which used to be the sound of a bird making, uh, that a bird makes. Or you can use words like facts that were made up at the time that didn't exist before, but somebody just made them up. Which makes us realize how difficult keyword searching can be when you're <laughs> confronted with like 80 million documents in a need discovery case. That's exactly right. And that's how I got into this business. Um, I actually did a study on the word strike. I was going through my dictionary one day, and for some reason I came across the page with the word strike on it. And there are 80 definitions on that page for the word strike. And I said, how on earth does anybody understand anything when there's so many definitions here? Some of the words for strike, some of the meanings of strike have to do with starting a motion, striking out on a journey. Some of the meanings of the word strike have to do with stopping a motion, like striking a pose. Or baseball. <laughs> or baseball strikes, or labor strikes. Right. Um, how, how do people understand that? And the way they understand it is they use the context that the words in a sentence help to disambiguate, help us to understand the meaning of the other words in the sentence. Uh, I, I once took a, a simple sentence and looked up each one of those words in the dictionary, and it came to four quadrillion possible interpretations of that sentence. <laughs> oh, God. What's... But people don't, don't, generally don't notice that there's even any ambiguity in a sentence like that because they're so used to uh, understanding the sentence in context. Right. All right. Once again, we're talking to Herb Reitblatt, co-founder, chief scientist, and chief technology officer of Orchitech. All of this discussion around keyword searching, though, reminds me of the Clean Products versus Packaging Corporation of America case, where there was a big um, brouhaha and controversy of whether keyword searching was sufficient in this case, because the the plaintiffs didn't think so, the defend you know the defendants. Um, uh, had had a process for for e discovery and it del eliminated a lot of unnecessary irrelevant documents, but the other side was not satisfied and asked the judge to rule that they go back and do it all again. But Judge Nolan um, ruled that they had a mutually agreeable process. They agreed. They cooperated from the beginning, and keyword search was no less effective in this case, she thought, than, than predictive coding or other methods under predictive coding. That's a pretty big ruling, huh? Well, actually, that, that wasn't exactly the way it came down. The, the, the plaintiffs withdrew their request at some point. Um, they stopped demanding that the other side use predictive coding. Um, in the end, if you work hard enough, you can do anything you, anything you want to accomplish. You can accomplish with keyword searching, provided that you measure it. The problem is that it takes an awful, awful lot of effort. In that clean products case, one of the defendants spent 1,400 hours coming up with a keyword list to search for. Uh, and they, they evaluated the results, and they, they satisfied themselves, and eventually, I guess, they satisfied the plaintiff that it was, it was reasonable. But um, it took an awful lot of work to... Uh, to identify the, the right documents in that case. Uh, in, in another matter that we've looked at, um, they did keyword searching. They hired a group of temporary attorneys, contract attorneys, to read those documents. The temporary attorneys spent 1,100 hours reading the documents uh, that were identified by the keywords. In the end, 2% uh, of the keyword documents ended up being called responsive. So that's not a very uh, efficient use uh, of time. We had one in-house attorney do predictive coding uh, based on, on the, the same issues in that case, spent 14 hours training the predictive coding system, ended up at about the same place. Are you saying 14 hours versus 1,100? 
<laughs> so your bottom line from these kinds of cases is what exactly? Well, if you're willing to work hard enough, you can, in principle, accomplish whatever you want with keyword searching. What it, you have, but you have to really work hard at it. Uh, you can accomplish the same things or even more if you use the technology to its full extent and take advantage of, of the opportunities that the, the technology can provide. That's all the time we have for today's program. It's been great having our guest, Herb Reitblatt, with us today. Herb is co-founder, chief scientist, and chief technology officer of Orchitech. He's recognized as the father of concept search and is an expert in search and retrieval technology. He's also a co-founder of the Electronic Discovery Institute and a member of OLP's Board of Governors. In part two of this discussion, we'll be getting into more aspects of predictive coding and the various methods that fall under that umbrella. I want to thank our audience for tuning in and remind you that we will be producing these programs on a regular basis and that you can listen to this program again and check out future programs in the podcast section of the OLP website. That is the OLP.org. Please let us know what topics you'd like us to cover and who you'd like us to interview on future programs. You can email us at info at the OLP.org or call us at 760-610-5462. That number again is 760-610-5462. Have a wonderful day and thank you for listening to Consider This.